Lee de Soto Brown and Martin Despang welcome you back uh, to our relentless search of humanity and humility <laughs> in the built environment. Mm -hmm. And this is our Veterans Week show, yes. acknowledging yesterday's holiday. Yes. And we're going to look both into uh, a piece of veteran architecture. Uh, and have someone else with us who you see in the middle uh, here mm -hmm. already, and that's uh, a veteran in a more, on top of that, in a human way. Yeah. And that's Mr. Right Ronald Lindgren. Hi, Ron. Hello, how are you? Thanks for the kind words. Well, and, and thank you again for having served and um, helped us out, you know, also us Germans, you know, getting us back on our feet after we screwed up and and all of that and more. And you've been, you've been a Vietnam veteran and you are a Vietnam veteran, right? Yes, indeed. So thank you for that, much yeah. appreciated. Yeah. And uh, today we actually go to another island and uh, talking where we are from, DeSoto, you're Hawaiian. So yes. please go to the next slide and tell us where we go today. All right, well, we're going from the island of Oahu to the island of Maui and we are going to Kapalua, which as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, there's the Hawaiian Islands. There's a little tiny red dot that shows you where Kapalua is. And Kapalua is a development that occurred starting after uh, agriculture began to wind down in the Hawaiian Islands and we began to shift to a more of a tourist economy. And so places that had been agriculture began to have uh, these substantial developments built and hotels and resorts. And mm -hmm. that's where we're going right mm -hmm. now to one of those resorts. Well, me coming from practice as well, I would have a hard time how to even build on this, in this most prestige part of the Hawaiian Islands, yeah. right? So next slide, uh, Ron, share with us how you approach that tricky, uh, you know, challenge. All right. Well, you're, you're seeing a rumbling of what many people, and I still believe uh, in my heart, was the most memorable hotel lobby in all of Hawaii, drawn by uh, the very famous West Coast architectural delineator, Carlos Diniz. And uh, he was one person we always used on every project whenever possible, if the client had deep pockets. Ah. And a little side note, and here you see him next to you. And on top of that, we actually see a project which is next door, which is the Financial Plaza of the Pacific, which has been built a little earlier in the late 60s. But that is master planned by Victor Grun, and he worked for Victor Grun and had mm. you know, met many uh, young yeah. upcoming architects and yeah. discovered his sort of talent in suggestive illustrations. What I found remarkable here is actually, Ron, and this speaks to your design, that is actually you see actually more... Uh, sort of uh, the natural environment and humans interacting and actually very little architecture. Correct. Right. right. And I'm, I, if I can just yes, say too, the, 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 we've got these very the, uh, slim openings pillars. towards the ocean were, were 20 feet wide and 55 feet tall and all just open to the elements and the beautiful tropical breezes. And of course, the view of Molokai and Lanai with the sun setting between them each and every night on a good day. Yeah, wonderful. Right, and the pillars are so thin and so elegant that yeah. they don't get in the way of the view. And they actually got even got even better in, in usually the renderings are better than the building. But not in this They're case. They're kind of eye candy, and yeah. in this case, the opposite. No, no. But let's move on because of course, the project had to take on form, but primarily it was designed from inside out, which we see here. But the next picture here is, uh, is an architectural model of it. And at that time, I think, Ron, was the firm already called uh, Killingsworth, Stricker, Lindgren, Wilson and Partners? Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And tell and, us who did uh, the models in the office. Uh, all of our in-house models were done by uh, a design partner named Larry Stricker, uh, responsible for the design of several other uh, Hawaiian resorts that I think you will be covering in future programs. We will do it. We look much for it. And, and hi to Larry. Mm. Look forward to see you. And Larry is actually on the way to another project that he was the project yeah. architect on, yeah. on another on it, which is the Big Island. So right. you guys stay tuned and be excited about that one. Right. Let's move on to the next slide, which for me shows this very unarchitectural approach of sort of these uh, shelters, uh, which are very open again to the, to the breeze and they're just cascading down, just like the landscape does. Yeah. So a very dematerialized approach, 
which is very unusual because we're in the mid 80s and we'll get to the zeitgeist more in detail, but this is when architectural form was may, way more important yeah. than any other performance, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I picked this uh, for a reason uh, where we're gonna tell you in a little bit um, that we weren't able to uh, take pictures of the project um, in addition to the pictures we have, but the one on the right is from a project we're gonna do a show with you, Ron, uh, next, but you already sort of tested that sort of detailing of the lanais, which are basically have uh, more like uh, loggias, as we talked in previous show, and the front part is more the sticking, mm -hmm. licking and sticking mm -hmm. out lanai, mm -hmm. right? Very, very elegant detailing. Um, and so let's go to the next slide. The next slide is basically, again, showing the composition of the building in itself. Again, the 80s have been tricky because being in postmodernism, so the question is how literal were you? And while this might look like an additional cove, actually you would never think about it as that when, when, you're like, when you're like in the building. When you're in the building, the building is very much perceived as from this inside out versus outside in approach, and that's perfectly portrayed in the next picture. And you please, uh, Larry, uh, tell us some exciting details about what we see. Next uh, slide, please. And also what we don't see and what was planned. This is slide number well, let me six. Say that, let me say that the previous slide uh, showed that we had uh, purposefully been very informal and country casual with the arrangement of our guest room wings. Uh, yeah. And that was in response to the fact that a, a previous architect had done a very fine hotel design for the site, but the owners found it to be much too urban for his beautiful rural uh, site. So we had the advantage of someone who hadn't met the client's requirements and could build off of those so that we, we really wanted the buildings to fit into the natural surroundings in an informal, comfortable, and heavily landscaped way. And I think referring to the end of last week's show, I think we can say, if my memory is correct from us talking, Ron, that was, these were SLM, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. San Francisco office. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's move on to the next slide, which has actually surprised me. It's the same model as the previous one, and it basically shows the intricacy. And that makes us actually talk about, as you always uh, recall and remind us of, that Ed was a classicist, right? And explain more to us why and how this applies to how you approach the building. Yes, despite the fact that our guest room wings were purposefully informal as they stepped down the 10% slope and actually stepped from five stories down to two and one mm, stories mm. nearest the ocean, the lobby uh, experience and the entry experience is very formal and very classic and very traditional. Ed Killingsworth, uh, my boss, mentor, and friend, was very much a classicist. And he was convinced that if you didn't arrive at a hotel front door or entry experience that wasn't memorable, that didn't make you feel that you had, you had come to a special place, that he had failed. Well, he didn't fail here. He surrounded an enormous motor court with open porticos from which beautiful flowering vines hung. Uh, an, a very large port cochere, and as a classicist, there's an access right to the center of the port cochere and right to the lobby to the point where guests would walk in on that axis and suddenly find themselves in that gloriously high ceiling open lobby. And let's jump, let's revisit that again, next slide here. And you just sort of were pointing out, you know, that classicism, classic, comes from Rome and Greece, right? Right. right. And they, although they're on Mediterranean, so there's a certain similarity to climate. It's not as cold as further right. north in Germany, for example. But you still, the approach of the Greek temples is different. You have a distinct difference mm -hmm. between the inside and the outside. And the other thing I was going to say was that these buildings are very obviously modern. They mm -hmm. are not replicas of Greek temples. Yeah. And we went through a stage where there were lots of buildings that were replicas of Greek temples that were universities and banks. Mm -hmm. And this uses a lot of the same things, but it isn't an exact replica. Yeah. It's yeah, modern. Yeah. And, and, and one thing to add on that, on, we're in the tropics. So these are kind of tropical classicist Absolutely. modern buildings, yes, which is right. very exciting, right? Yeah. Let's move on to the next slide. And 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the, and we're, we're on this now as a research to look at the evolution of a signature yeah. element within yeah. the Killingsworth body of work. So you started, we started out with the Kahala Hilton, which we will go back to and do a show together mm -hmm. more in detail. But it basically, and the Kahala condos, we did two shows about it, it basically has the single column that has a negative corner, the mesian right. corner. Then in the last show, the former Seaside Hotel, you basically have a positive corner and you indented the center yes, of the column. Right. While here, you guys actually went crazy and, went <laughs> and did the quadrupling. And you right. were just this morning when we try to, you know, uh, you know, talk, uh, Ron, you were telling me about the quadruple rings of your Audi that you had to go to the, the, the shop, right? And to get, I mean, that's why Audi choose the, the three rings. That has to do with the Olympic and the rings, right? Okay, well, so, was, so tell us more about the four columns, Ron. Uh, Ed Kinleysworth had always uh, wanted his lofty soaring columns uh, to be designed and detailed in such a way that it looked as if the beams themselves mm. that connect to the columns actually just slipped right on through. Mm. And that was a matter of creating uh, indentations in the columns or, or, as you say, treating corners and so forth. But here his special expressionism is probably shown in its greatest advantage because this time the beams actually slide through the four uh, column clusters. Yeah, and you pointed out, you see on the, on the right, the detail, you see that uh, dark thing up there, and this is a lighting fixture, and tell us more about that one. Yeah, it, at night, uh, beautifully enough, although the lobby itself was very residentially furnished with table lamps and uh, floor lamps and so forth, most of the light came from the fact that the lighting designer placed hand fixtures on the floor level, shining up in the space uh, in the very center space uh, between all four of these uh, clustered columns. This meant that the inside faces, all eight of them, shone brightly and illuminated the lobby in a very romantic way. Mm. And we, we, we can't and won't hide any longer the reason that I already indicated that we can't show you images from how this looked in this project, but we will show in, a, in one of Larry's project, the Ihilani, which you, Ron, and I, when you were here for the Docomomo Symposium and both DeSoto and you were keynote speakers, by the way, um, we drove up to and we basically saw it, you know, illuminated and we will, we will share that with the audience. But let's jump on to the, to the next picture here. All these pictures are basically from basically the web out there. And uh, while the project had been completed in the, in the mid 70s, um, uh, while you pointed something out that uh, Ed sort of had uh, almost a little Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde attitude towards the, uh, uh, the built environment, the architecture, and the, the interior furnishing, Ryan? Yes, Ed's, Ed's concern for uh, hotels was that comfort was a paramount uh, thing that had to be achieved. And it comforted in, in, in many ways. Comfort in the surroundings, uh, comfort in, in the views, comfort when you sat down in a chair in the lobby. Now, modern furniture and the, the, the very famous uh, mid-century modern furniture and the work of the European masters like Corbusier and Mies, beautiful to look at, not so fine to sit in for longer than maybe 20 minutes. Ed, Ed had the feeling that the furniture should be comfortable, which meant that it also had to look comfortable. Yeah. So he, he rarely, if ever, used uh, pieces of modern furniture. These pieces obviously are, were built uh, contemporaneously with the hotel, but they were designed for visual and actual physical comfort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let's go to the next slide. While it was built, you know, in the mid uh sort of towards the second half of the 70s, it's, it had its prime time in the 80s, mm -hmm. and we always encouraged the audience to think about what was going on with them yeah. in, the, yeah. in the 80s. Yeah. What was going on with you in the 80s up there on the right? Well, one of the major sort of cultural, pop culture icons of the 1980s in the United States, and even internationally, because you probably saw him in Europe too, Absolutely. was Tom Selleck in the role of Magnum P.I., which is a tremendously popular TV program. And there's a picture of Tom Selleck on the front of TV Guide, and there's a picture of me in the 1980s 
also wearing the iconic Aloha shirt. And as you pointed out, unlike Steve McGarrett from the previous decade in Hawaii Five O, Magnum was dressed for the tropics, mm -hmm. and we're looking at a building which is also dressed for the tropics or made for the tropics in yeah. the same way. And Ron, explain more to us what we see, and especially the the shading devices. Yes, there were, uh, as you can see in the photograph, there were louvers, uh, and they were vertical up near the uh, roof line, but then they kicked out almost as if they were uh, keeping rain from coming in. Yeah. But of course they were uh, making the, the spaces inside shady and protective, and, uh, and louvers like that are sort of inherently tropical looking. And uh, we actually had uh, originally designed some enormous double hung windows to be up and concealed behind the upper louvers in a winter storm, which happened occasionally, uh, just by using uh, a weights and someone's own arm strength, they could actually pull those uh, double, uh, double hung windows down for protection and the weights would actually hang in the very center of the cluster of columns. Wow. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, so, and I have, a, I have a house built in 1930, and the double-hung yeah. windows function exactly that yeah, same yeah. way. Exactly. Okay, now almost half of the show, and now comes the point where I have to reveal, while talking, this is a veteran show, and now we come to the fallen veteran yep. as far as this project here. So next slide here. This is in 2006, where our most activist journalist, Kurt Sandman, who was successful of preventing, which would have been horrible, projects to the islands. And here he was sadly reporting uh, that pretty much this project here would become a fallen soldier. Yeah. And for the reason that we see at the top right, and we would go to the next slide, but we're not going to spend much time because it's going to hurt my eye for sure, because <laughs> this is what is, has been replaced by. And, uh, and we agree, we don't want to talk. I think it was the Marriott chain or something. It looks to me, uh, talking the literal uh, mid-80s, the postmodern looks like an upside-down M. Yeah, and I think that's, w. that's all what the project pretty much is. And you were telling me, Ron, that you had almost saved it by talking uh, that it would have been taken over your project by, by Disney. And this is what very ironically, uh, this is referring to the show with Larry to come in the future. In, in case of the Ihilani, this actually has been successful because the original Ihilani, which you see on the left, has been saved and then by other architects in an equally hideous style, yep. it has been added on, but at least the original was basically uh, uh, kept, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything you guys yeah. want to add to, add to this uh, sad, sadness? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> the, the, the irony is that the uh, uh, condominiums that were built uh, that replaced the entirely destroyed uh, Kapalua Bay Hotel are timeshare. And I was given the opportunity by the Disney Corporation to perhaps have saved the original Kapalua because they asked me to do some drawings for them, uh, gave me two weeks and a $10,000 check, and said, uh, keep it secret, but we want to buy the Kapalua Bay Hotel, but it had to have uh, some timeshare yeah. considerations. Well, unfortunately, by keeping it that secret, the Disney lawyers didn't find out that at that time, the county of Maui did not allow timeshares anywhere. Mm, bummer. Well, there we go. So it's down. It is not anymore, but it actually it is in many ways. And let's it's commemorated. It's let's memorialized. Let's go in how many ways. Let's go yeah. to the next slide. This is our walking encyclopedia, Don Hibbert, mm -hmm. and his famous book, if we can get the camera back to studio mm -hmm. here, Designing Paradise. So, That's Ron, you were designing paradise because if we can get to the page back, he was basically dedicating to you uh, four, double page, four and a half double pages uh, to your project. And uh, so that way, um, again, within a, a, an entire chapter about the Killingsworth work, mm -hmm. and you were also telling me as an addition on, shame on me, I haven't you know, referenced that, but at the end of the book, he makes a very important point, right, as well, Ron? He, his last chapter of the book, he's trying to explain why there weren't going to be any more large, uh, especially mega hotels designed probably in Hawaii, and it had all sorts of reasons. 
And those reasons built up to what he thought were the reasons why the Kapalua Bay Hotel disappeared. Mm -hmm. So the last chapter in this magisterial account of Hawaiian hospitality design history uh, is of great interest. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's called The Close of an Era. Absolutely. So then this is this is print media here and it's still in print and it's wonderful. So you guys should all get it. Uh, the next thing we can do research on is obviously the World Wide Web. Go to the next picture here. I found this one here. Uh, this is uh, Harvey Keller from your, your uh, adopted home in, in Long Beach, uh, Ron. And he did an interview with uh, your friend and boss and partner at Killingsworth, which is almost like an hour long. And on minute two, he basically uh, states that this year project is one of the most beautiful ones that the office has ever done. So that's that's a great compliment, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, greatest you can get from your boss and, and friend and more, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Indeed. And another one here on the next one here, this is one of the most famous and accomplished uh, architectural photographers of the modern movements, uh, Julius Schulman, who we had pointed out when we were doing the show about the Kahala condos, uh, his, his uh, famous um, photograph of the apartments from the ocean side made it on a cover page of the main postcard that was promoting the uh, National Dokomomo event that you mm -hmm. were both keynote speakers. And he also was persuaded, probably didn't have to be much to basically yeah, yeah, yeah. go here, yeah. which was actually quite some time after because the Kala is, is, is mid-60s, mm -hmm. early to mid-60s, and this is a decade later. Yes, right? exactly. So there's a famous Julia Schulman picture of the Kapu Little Bay Hotel. And I also have to say that, you know, your guys' legacy and uh, this project's legacy lives on within the next generation of architects. We go to the next slide, and maybe you guys can say some words about that. Well, this is, you're making a comparison here between one of the projects you worked on and this hotel that we're talking about. And on the left is this um, kindergarten or preschool that you did for a university in Germany. Mm -hmm. And what you did there was sort of a similar thing to what was done at the Kapalua Bay, in which there is a view. You're looking at a view. You've got a structure that is very light, very delicate, and it, it makes you want to look through it to the view beyond. Because your preschool's in Germany, obviously it couldn't be open, so it's glazed. It's got windows there, but it's not dissimilar to what we are seeing at the Kapalua yeah. Bay, yeah. too. And it is, has this inside-out approach. However, then next slide, it will always end up having a form. And again, we want to point out Zeitgeist at the bottom. This is, was that pivotal point in America where from Jimmy Carter, mm -hmm. uh, it went on to, uh, from, prog I mean, the, the conclusion of the progressive era to the beginning of the reactionary era. Yes. And this was Ronald Reagan. So yes. that was embodied through formalism and postmodernism. And, and Rana, I highly credit you for having resisted that temptation and almost stubbornly just kept on uh, keeping the, the torch of, of, of modernism, and especially here in wonderful tropical modernism up, that the architecture becomes what I call, you know, architecture or archi-nature, mm -hmm. which you can see it's very similar, although it doesn't want to look like architecture, which biomimicry wants to unfortunately do these days. Yeah. It is truly architecture, it's classical architecture, but in its way it's performing and also in the way it comes across, it's very similar to how nature performs, mm -hmm. right? And right in this picture, we see a really commonality of the upright tree trunks of the coconut palms and the uprights of the building. Yeah, and next slide. Okay, and there we are going back to the kindergarten or mm -hmm. the preschool, mm -hmm. excuse me, which is at the top. It's actually built into a hillside, so it is insulated, but being partly underground. But you're pointing out also that we've got this uh, similarity, or we've got the situation again of the zeitgeist of the 1970s. That's your car, correct? That was that is... the Americano as a kid. <laughs> I needed one of these cars that was playing within the sandbox. Right. This is a 72 Plymouth Fury. And you got to have it for yourself. And I had to have it when I was a student. But right. also on the bottom right, this is the project that has informed me the most. And this is I.M. Pay's uh, bank in Lincoln, Nebraska, the NBC bank. But the point that I want to make is that I also told the emerging generation there is a very distinctive difference between the early 70s yes. and the late 70s. And what is that? Well, that was the, that was the energy crisis of 1973-74. 
And we went from being very wasteful with energy to realizing we had to conserve energy as much as possible. In this particular case, you, as I said, put the building underground to insulate it. But there is a difference between building something in right mm -hmm. from the beginning and then trying to add it on yeah, yeah. and how skillfully you do that. And so was based while my car was, you know, the epitome of the gas coal. guzzler, right. 72. His building was from 76 and it's very environmentally conscious, yeah, beautifully right. done. Right. And next slide is going back to the to the previous comparison. And while, you know, our project had been published in these sort of eco books here, I want to, you know, you know, thank you, Ron, that you hadn't taken what I can call if you use, you know, cars as vehicles for thought mm -hmm. and AMC PESA approach in architecture mm -hmm. where, which many eco architects kind of tried to do, mm -hmm. but they couldn't really, I mean, it was sort of a little silly, right? Correct. And, and, and AMC so, PESA was this very iconic car of the 1970s that looked really interesting, but didn't really yeah, fulfill yeah, what yeah, it was yeah. supposed to do. And so I call your project more, you know, having foreseen what another island, uh, at least until recently, before yeah. he sold his house on the big island, this is the old rocker Neil Young, Neil Young, who had a 59, so has Lincoln Continental. He said, I'm not going to cash for clunker that. I'm going to have a crew of world-renowned mm -hmm. engineers converted to a 100 miles per gallon hybrid. Uh -huh. And your project, Ron, never needed to never need to be converted because it was already it was already a, right. a, a, a hundred miles per gallon car you know as far as performance because it's such a tropical exotic bioclimatic right. uh, structure right. right and not energy wasteful no and i was uh, next slide here second to last is i was recently to the subject matter of that our president has once again now what he already had you know threatened us with saying i pull out of the paris agreement this is from two years ago, uh, where our government basically said, and our governor said, we resist that and we right. do it anyways. And look in this in this article, uh, you know, which picture they used as to portray Hawaii. Exactly. And so there's a picture of Kapalua as an unspoiled, beautiful thing that needs to be preserved. And thus we need to be energy conservators. Yeah. And so I think the legacy and the memory of your project is so typical. Just like you made a compliment to our PI in car. There it is. Which you see at the bottom, which of course we now have to swap to an electric engine. Exactly. Right? It's wasteful. But uh, we only drive it once a week for the shows, right? right? And there's Ron in the picture too. <laughs> exactly. And there he is with uh, the project that followed this one here. Correct. That we're in the process of making the show. We're hyper excited about that. Right. We're going to phase out by uh, providing an image that you just had found as of this morning, Ron, and explain this to us really quickly. Last yeah, so picture. last picture, there it is. Yes, I, I discovered uh, in my files a postcard of the hotel, which was sold in the lobby of the Kapalua Bay Hotel. And it shows the happy juxtaposition of the hotel, uh, Kapalua Bay itself, which uh, for many years was listed by the U.S. government as the finest beach in the entire United mm -hmm. States. But when a hotel guest maybe had eaten a few too many times in the hotel with the hotel food, they could choose to walk down to the beach, traverse it, walk up some steps, and enter this independent restaurant, very handsomely done by a local Hawaiian architect whom, unfortunately, I can't uh, identify. And, and you being Hawaiian, too, how do you categorize the approach of these Haole guys? Which well, uh, that's a good point, but I think as long as it's done sensitively and done, done well and done uh, thoughtfully, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what race you are. You're going to do a good thing. You're going to do a good thing. Greatest compliment you can get, Ron. Thank you. So we want to thank Indeed. You. Thank you so much. No, we, th we have to thank you. Thank you so much for having been on the show with us. Yes. The first time, but not at all the last time. No, this no, was no. just the beginning. And not going to let well. you go. So we're actually going to see you uh, next week already for another masterpiece of Killingsworth. And um, you guys can get your spirit back up because this is the only exception to the fortunate rule that all the other yeah. Killingsworth are still, still around standing. and treated very well. By and the we way. can see them and enjoy them. So we look forward to see you then. And until then, please uh, stay as vintagely veteran as Ron. Thank you very much.